Jewish workshops and AISH webinars. It is a pleasure to be joining all of you today, and we are extremely privileged to have Sarah Hanna Radcliffe on the line. Before we get started, I'd love to see who's joining us and where you're from. So if you could please go to your chat box and write your first name or your initials and where you're joining us from, I'd love to be able to welcome you. If this is your first time on a webinar, welcome. Um, you'll see from GoToWebinar, there's a little control panel on your right-hand side, and there's something called a chat box or question box. You can go ahead and put your name right in there. And throughout today's webinar, we like to make it as interactive as possible. So please feel free to also put your questions in, and we will do our best to get to as many of those live on the line as well. So let me go ahead and start welcoming everyone. Oh, wow, this is amazing. Welcome Leah from Baltimore and Linda from St. Louis. Welcome NS from Baltimore. Stephanie from Dallas. Basia, welcome. Elisheva from Baltimore. Esther from Yerushalayim. Welcome Rabbi Singer. Welcome Rhonda from Toronto. Dossie from Silver Spring. Ashley from Pennsylvania. Welcome Yael from London and Miriam from Lakewood. Joelle from New Jersey, welcome. Cantor Neil Schwartz, welcome. Um, let me see here, Caroline from Toronto and Howie from Florida, Courtney from New Jersey, Liat from Cleveland, Ellen from Geneva, Alana from Jerusalem, welcome, welcome. Michelle from Toronto and Nick from Na Rick from Nashville, Tali from Toronto, PP from Miami, Pearl from New York, Avram from Baltimore, DK from Pittsburgh, Welcome to all of you. And there are more and more people coming in. This is really nice to see people from all over the world joining us today. Welcome Rivka from Beitar and Rachel from Brooklyn. Chaya from France, welcome. TA from Dallas, Edna from New York, Rivka from VA, welcome. Nechama from Munsi, Michal from Ramat Beit Shemesh, Tara from Dallas, Miriam from Barrow Park, welcome. Shira from Dallas, Hana from Beit Shemesh, ML from Connecticut, Dina from Texas, <clears throat> welcome to you. Shawnee from New Jersey, Marissa from New York, Sarah from Barrow Park, Samantha from Philly, Welcome, Malka from Miami Beach, and the list goes on. I may be here for the rest of the whole hour, so <laughs> let me just say a huge, huge welcome to everyone. It is so nice to have you all here with us today. Oh, and here we go, Edith from St. Paul. Welcome, Layla from LA. Um, as people continue to join us and flood in, I just want to remind you, please don't leave in the middle. We're likely to hit capacity on today's webinar, and I don't want anyone to get locked out. If you're having any trouble hearing um, or seeing today's webinar with Sarah Hanna's webcam, please come back to the question box as well and just let me know. I can help you troubleshoot some of those problems. Um, over the past three years, Sarahana has brought her expertise in parenting and relationships to our Jewish workshops community, and we are so fortunate to have her with us. Today, Sarahana is going to introduce a brand new topic that we haven't talked about yet that people have been requesting for ages. We are going to begin an in-depth exploration of what ADHD is and isn't and how to get a better understanding of the symptoms to look out for so we can help ourselves, our spouses, and our children in a more positive and productive way. Again, make sure to stay on the line until the end to hear about this one-time chance to also join Sarahana week after week for a full live online program at a special discounted rate just for joining today. Plus, we had hundreds of questions come in ahead of time, and we'll get to as many live on the line as possible. And of course, when you have a question today while you're here on the line, we'd love to take those as well. So please feel free to come back and put them into the question box, and we will do our best to answer them. It is truly an honor to be hosting Sarah Hanna Radcliffe today. A registered member of the College of Psychologists of Ontario, Sarah Hanna has been practicing marriage, parenting, and individual counseling for over 40 years. Sarahana is a well sought after lecturer on stress management, parenting, anger management, and emotional well being. She is the author of Raise Your Kids Without Raising Your Voice, The Fear Fix, Make Yourself at Home, and five other books on family life and emotional well being. Sarahana, we are so grateful to have you joining us today. I'm going to go ahead and pass the microphone over to you. How are you today? <laughs> well, I'm. I'm fine, basically. I'm looking forward to our webinar, but I do have a bit of a cold, and I, I hope I don't know if my voice is sounding weird to you, but it sounds really weird in my head. But we will, <laughs> we'll do okay. Does it sound normal to you? Sounds totally normal to me. So Fantastic. you're good. 
he will go then. Okay. So please excuse me if I cough a little bit or whatever. But okay. Now, yes, ADHD is an amazing topic because it really does affect all of us. We are either raising a child with ADHD or we're experiencing symptoms ourselves or our spouse is experiencing it or our extended family members or our colleagues and, you know, everybody around us because some of the symptoms of ADHD are just kind of the normal quirky things that we human beings are subject to. So even if we don't have full criteria for an official diagnosis, a lot of us suspect that we or our kids are dealing with something and that something is neurological in nature. We're going at what else it could be also because truly a lot of the symptoms in ADHD are found in many other uh, disorders, call them, okay? And disorders, you know, the way we categorize mental health disorders these days is that our entire personality can really be some one disorder or there are so many disorders uh, in our latest uh, categorization system of the DSM-5. Um, so we're going to look at the fact that there's a lot of names for things too and see what does this mean and can it help us or is it getting in our way or how does that all figure in? Now, it does help us to know the symptoms that we're looking at even more than knowing the names of the disorders. <laughs> so this is what we're going to focus on today. And if you get confused at any point along the way, I can tell you that I was actually quite confused while I was putting all this stuff together because there's so much overlap. So I expect that there will be some confusing stuff here. I will pull it all together for us at the end. So like Jillian said, please stay with us so we can make sense of everything I'm going to tell you before we get to the end. Um, so, okay, what I've said so far is that everybody has some neurological they're called soft signs, um, which is our own quirky things. We may be disorganized or we may be forgetful or uh, we may have, you know, um, impatience or impulsivity. That is, you know, this, that's part of our wired in personality. If we have enough of these kinds of symptoms, they fall into a particular diagnostic category. Um, but it is helpful for us to know, especially when we're raising a child, but also I guess when we're living with somebody, that these are actual neural symptoms, meaning it's part of the brain structure. We aren't dealing with a bad child, heaven forbid. Or, um, we're not being um, in ourselves when we're struggling with forgetting where we put our keys all the time. It's not because we're we're stupid or we're lazy or, or there's, I don't know, we just have a bad attitude. It's because there's something about the way our brain works that causes it difficult for us, let's say where the keys are, just, you know, when it comes to a child who has to remember where his you know, notes are, where his pencils are, where the assignment is, and to take it home and to bring it back out who has these neurological challenges is truly challenged. And just knowing that there is something going on like this can really help us parent more compassionately, live with ourselves more compassionately, live with our spouses more compassionately. It's nobody's fault. We, we do work on our challenges and deficits to the best of our ability, but it's not because we all are suffering from bad problems, okay? And also, when we can pinpoint a little bit more accurately where symptoms are coming from, um, then we can actually pinpoint treatment better too, or even the Gnostic process, because, you know, where do we get a diagnosis from? You know, could you just maybe share, let me know here, just write in the chat box. Um, is there, did you go to your GP, your general practitioner, and to get a diagnosis for HD? Did you go to a psychologist or a psychiatrist, or did you self-diagnose? <laughs> Can let's get an idea, uh, or, or are you still wondering about whether, you know, you? ADHD is actually a factor. You're not really sure who to go to or how to find out. Could you just orient me? Like, where are you all learning about ADHD from? 
in your family, in your life. And maybe, Jillian, you can... Let yeah, me know absolutely. What people are saying um, it looks like neuropsychologist, um, a neurologist, mm -hmm. a psychiatrist, mm -hmm. a developmental pediatrician, a psychologist or a psychiatrist for the first child and then self-diagnosis for the rest. Um, self-diagnosed mm -hmm. my son with ADHD, psychologist and pediatrician. Um, possibilities clinic did diagnosis. Uh, some people are still wondering. They have appointments scheduled. Yeah. Um, yes. Yeah, psychiatrist. We've spoken to our GP. Still wondering mm -hmm. if my daughter has it. There's a, lot of, it. There's a lot, of, lot of people involved in the diagnostic process. It's interesting that actually I didn't suggest it and none of you suggested it either, but sometimes classroom teachers are suggesting diagnoses. And I think that we'll see today why a classroom teacher is not the one <laughs> to suggest a diagnosis. Um, you, you know, when we together look at how complicated this issue is, we'll see that it really requires um, the most competent professional you can find. Okay, so I think that's one of the things that'll come out of this for diagnoses. What the classroom teacher can definitely suggest is that somebody should be making a diagnosis. Okay, that, so the classroom teacher might, you know, make the referral or ask the principal of the school to make, you know, to make the referral um, to get a diagnosis. But the classroom teacher, just like that, is not in a position to really know what's going on because, well, let's take a look at what might be going on. Okay, there's a lot of wrong ideas out there about ADHD. Well, if we have a kid who's wild, does that mean he has ADHD? Or if we have um, chronic overwhelm, do we have ADHD? Or if our spouse constantly forgets to pay bills that, you know, he or she said they pay, pay ADHD? And one of the important things to know is that ADHD has a lot of criteria to get to an actual diagnosis, which we're going to look at those criteria together. Uh, to get a diagnosis, you need to meet query. So sometimes you go to a professional and they say, well, you know, your child doesn't meet the criteria for ADHD, but something's going on. Um, but again, we're, we're going to look at this. Um, let's just take a look at a couple of cases. Okay, this is, a you know, some things that have come my way professionally. There was a child, uh, mom complained about this child of hers who um, was throwing erasers around in the classroom, bothering people, um, getting hyper and wild and refusing to sit unless he was doing art or something that he liked, you know, um, giving up quickly if the teacher managed to force him to do a little bit of seat work, you know. So then if the teacher got more intense about, uh, look, you have to sit because you can't disrupt the class, this particular child will get very melodramatic, um, start threatening to kill himself, say nobody likes him, he hates himself, he doesn't want to live. And of course, in this particular case, the classroom teacher got quite alarmed and was assuming that the child had some deep psychological issues, understandably, and arranged for um, the child to be removed from the class to a safe room that they had in this particular school uh, where he could sit and read his books with um, a kind of a, a person beside him to keep him comfortable. And so his behavior worsened and worsened uh, over time until they got a proper assessment. Um, because, you know, the theory here that the child has psychological problems, I mean, removing the child from the classroom to have um, cozy time, let's say, when he felt stressed, would not be the complete treatment for that. And, um, and also, it wasn't clear, you'll see along, that that's actually what was going on going on. But um, so the teacher in this case, the child was anxious and depressed, okay? Um, but maybe he just had a behavioral issue. Like maybe, maybe this was all uh, 
intentional on his, he's an attention seeking child, maybe something was going on in his home, maybe his parents are getting divorced and, you know, he's going through kind of a crisis there and he's just acting out in the classroom. Hard to tell unless you start interviewing the child, right? Um, maybe he just doesn't like schoolwork, he has an attitude. Uh, possible still, we don't have doses for everything. Um, maybe he had a learning disability that made sitting down and doing classwork just too difficult for him and this was his way of coping. We wouldn't know that unless he had a full psychological assessment to find out how is he taking information in, is he processing it, is he able to give it back out, is it organized in his brain. Um, maybe he's anxious and perfectionistic and maybe he's got OCD and something's ticking him off there and he cannot settle himself or can he articulate to anybody what's going on with him but maybe his head is filled with you know terrifying thoughts and obsessions and whatever you know again somebody would have to ask okay this is and the only person who's going to know to ask is somebody who can do a proper assessment uh, maybe he has an auditory processing difficulty and the teacher's up there talking and he's completely overwhelmed that has to be tested so there's that kid um let's look at an adult okay uh there's a woman who has very little patience when it comes to her kids bad about it but she finds herself snapping all the time irritable she's very overwhelmed by housework can't really get on top of things the laundry is never completely ready the dinner is never ready anywhere near on time and what a chaos there um she's creative type so she likes to do other things and uh, but she's home with a baby and a, and a couple of preschoolers and it's just frustrating for her she can't get her creative stuff done and things she's supposed to do to make this household run are not getting done. So sometimes compulsive and she's online all the time. Uh, you know, what's wrong with her? <laughs> like, does she have ADHD? Um, you know, why don't you guess along with me? What could be, what could be going on with uh, the adult in this case? Do you want to put a couple of your ideas in the chat box? Let's see if we can figure this out or I'll tell you. I'll tell you what I have to, but why don't you share your ideas with me? We're all amateur diagnosticians, and we will continue to be amateur diagnosticians after this class as well. <laughs> we're not going to, we're not going to know that much, but we're at least going to know what to ask. Okay, what do you think about this? Lady? Um, it could What's be that she's her? disorganized or has a lack of discipline, um, possibly depression, just an overwhelmed mother, a lack of mm -hmm. sleep, doesn't feel fulfilled. Someone said you just described me yes. exactly. <laughs> um, yeah. A general anxiety disorder, too much going on, not good at multitasking, um, could be a time management issue, just a lot of stress, no self-care. Sounds like most moms, really. <laughs> well, um, these are great ideas. And yeah, I'll tell you what I wrote down. Um, you know, yeah, maybe she's just uh, suffering from a lack of personal gratification here. She's very unfulfilled in this stage of her life and would rather she'll function better if she gets back to work or if she gets out of the house, is able to do her creative activities or whatever. Um, but maybe she's just um, emotionally labile and she's screaming at everybody and not managing because she has an disorder. Or maybe she has an anger disorder that she's she's really stable emotionally, but she just has a specific disorder and lacks patience and erupts just because she doesn't manage her anger very well. Um, or maybe she's just uh, like people said here, like you know she's just not got her act together. But maybe she does have ADHD, and it's not really possible for her to juggle all the different ways that a household needs to be managed all simultaneously it requires a lot of uh, frontal cortex activation um, that sometimes we don't have in, in the ADHD and the impulsivity which causes her to lash out at her children even though she feels very guilty about it and knows you know she doesn't want to do it um, she just can't stop herself maybe it is ADHD only assessment a true assessment will get to the bottom of what's ailing her. But if she doesn't have that assessment, she just might feel like, oh, I'm such a failure. I'm just such a horrible mother. Um, you know, I, I just, you know, this, she just, she just might come away feeling inadequate without knowing 
that there are things going on with her brain and she's not inadequate at all. She's coping at her max, but it's just not working. So yes, today we're not going to be diagnosticians, but we are to open our eyes to what questions could be asked about all this. Um, so let's start with the criteria, the actual criteria in the criteria book that your doctor or your psychologist or your psychiatrist will use of the DSM-5. Um, we're going to look at this and you might go along, think of yourself or your spouse or a child in the family, uh, have somebody in mind and tick off a yes or no as you go through these because need for um, this part of it, which is the inattentive symptoms in order to have a diagnosis of attention and deficit in the AD. ADHD stands for Attention Deficit Hyperactivity Disorder, and really a combination of two disorders, attention deficit and impulsive or impulsivity hyperactivity is the second part of it, okay? There's two separate parts, and a person may have one only, either inattentive type, or they might have the hyperactive type, or they sometimes have both types. But to have even one of these types, you need to be ticking off six, okay, six of these criteria that I'm going to read to you. So here they are. Uh, these are written for children. They are a little bit different when we're talking about adults, but just, you know, use your imagination and raise it to an adult. Uh, it's actually for uh, people six years of age and younger, but in fact, 17 years and up, which includes all the adults, diagnosis even if they have five of these symptoms. Okay, so you only need five if you're an adult. Uh, these symptoms have to have started before age 12 and uh, and have, la have lasted at least. So often fails to give close attention to details or makes careless mistakes in schoolwork or at work or with other activities. So this is kind of a it's careless detail, more than you think the average person is making. Okay, we all make mistakes. So that's number one. Number two, often has trouble holding attention on tasks or activities. So the word here is often, and it doesn't say always. So if a person with ADHD is actually enjoying an activity, their attention can be as long as anybody else's or longer, all right? So um, if your kid likes playing computer games, it might be on that hours at a time and inattentive in class. So often means while well, he's in class six hours a day or something, that's often. <laughs> um, often has trouble holding attention on tasks or even play activities, leisure activities. The third one is often does not seem to listen when spoken to directly. Now, this isn't about disobedience. It's about not getting it, not processing it. And the not listening here, we don't know if that's an auditory processing disorder, but we do know that it's part of the symptom here, HD, just isn't listening. It's not giving us eye contact, not, not seeming to get the information. And again, the key word is often. Okay, we could all be like this when we're tired or something. Um, the fourth one, often does not follow through with instructions, fails to finish either schoolwork or chores or things in the workplace or tasks that have to be formed like income things, you know, like um, for adults. So often does not follow through on instructions and fails to finish what needs to be finished. Uh, sorry if my eyes keep dropping down, but I am reading from a list here, okay? Okay, next one, often has trouble organizing tasks and activities. Next one, often avoids, dislikes, or is reluctant to do tasks that require mental effort over a long period of time, like schoolwork, homework, uh, filling out government forms, this kind of thing, just like loses patience for it in a shorter amount of time than everybody else. Nobody likes it, but most of us will plow through it person with ADHD dislikes it to the point where they can't really carry on. And the last 
possibility in this category is often loses things in every task and activities like materials, pencils, books, keys, like I said before, you know, notes, important things that they're supposed to keep track of. They go missing all the time, cell phones, whatever. Okay. Um, if you if you're under if you're 16 or under and you have six of those then your doctor will say that 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 is uh, an inattentive type of ADHD all right but what if you only have three of those well if you have three of those and three of the next type you'll have six altogether so you might come up with a diagnosis or um, you know, I'm not sure how they'll handle it exactly but Let's go for a minimum of six symptoms altogether for today. You're, in order to find out if this is really happening, usually uh, a, a school age child, we're going to have the teachers fill out questionnaires that ask questions, you know, and as far as they pertain to the classroom. And the Arfana? parents will fill out questionnaires. Yes. I'm so sorry to interrupt. Can you just repeat the fifth point? I think your um, sound like went out for a minute and we missed that one. Sorry. One, two, three, four, one minute. One, two, three, four, five. Often has trouble organizing tasks and activities. Thank you so much. Okay. And um, while we're there, was there any questions on that, uh, on, the, on these quests? Can, we're gonna do the hyperactive ones next, but just on these inattentive ones, does anybody have a question or should we just move forward? No, it just looked like we missed that fifth one. Got it. Okay. So let's look at now the criteria for the hyperactive impulsive type of ADHD. Again, we need um, six or more symptoms here for people 16 and under and five or more for 17 year olds. And this particular looks different in uh, adults than it does. It's because you know, you're know you gonna hear what I say for, for the symptoms for kids. Remember ADHD was actually developed with children in mind and only later was it recognized that many people have ADHD all the way throughout their lifespan. It used to be thought that you might have it as a child and then you might outgrow it during adolescence. And it wasn't really thought of as an adult disorder because most of the time it makes problems for people that are obvious in school. However, as we will see as we go through our course, it makes plenty of problems for people in adulthood, in the life, in our own life management and in our marriages. So it, it really is an adult disorder as well. But anyways, often fidgets with or taps hands or feet or squirms in seat. Okay, so that's number one. So this is a fidget person. Now on the adult level, it's kind of like who's just got a lot of movements, shaking a leg, always playing thing in their hand, possibly. Okay, but if you're just doing that one thing, it doesn't mean you have ADHD. And this is, you know, we have to meet criteria. We have to have a lot of these symptoms. Okay. Now, often leaves his seat in situations when remaining in the seat is expected. So, you know, with a, um, at a restaurant, um, at a religious service, uh, in this room, at a meeting, you know, just having trouble sitting, sitting still. We find in um, adults with ADHD that sitting still in traffic be very painful <laughs> so um, they might zoom in and out and uh, keep that car moving so that there's a sensation of movement number three often runs about or climbs in situations where it's not appropriate although in adults and teenagers who know better this might be simply they know not to climb or run about the room okay so they feel intense restlessness inside of themselves okay um, the next one, often unable to play or take part in leisure activities quietly. So, you know, lying on the beach is not this person's uh, favorite idea of a vacation. They might want to run around a busy city and shop till they drop. I think I have ADHD based on <laughs> some of these symptoms, actually. I don't. Um, is often on the go, acting as if driven by a motor. So this is a person who's like, go, go, go. This is, next one is interesting. Often talks excessively. It's like uh, the thing here is it seems to be talking at the listener. Whether the listener's listening doesn't seem to matter. Okay? And the, the person's talking and talking and just saying things, way too many details, way too much information, going on way too long without regard for the tolerance of a listener. And um, 
has a tendency to annoy people this way and has a corresponding very short attention span to be talked to. So frustrating kind of dynamic in relationships. Um, okay, next one often blurts out an answer before a question's even been uh, asked. So if your spouse has ADHD and you start trying to explain a problem you have, the spouse already jumps in and answers it before you've, uh, you know, finished your story um, in classroom, you know, answering before the teacher has asked and not with your hand up either. And the final one here often has trouble waiting their turn. Okay, so those are the uh, criteria. So let me just see if there's anything else about this. Um, in order for this to come out to be a um, like a diagnosis, as many things in the DSM-5 go, it's not only that you have the criteria, but that these criteria are actually making a problem for you in your life somewhere. So they're reducing the quality of something in the social or academic or work realm. They're really, it's impacting your life and that's what makes it a disorder. So for a lot of us, we have a lot of these symptoms, but there's no negative impact, we're, we're thriving, okay? So in that case, we actually don't have a disorder. <laughs> that's good to know. So, um, and we try to help our loved ones and ourselves move into that category where, yeah, this is our personality, but we're not suffering from it. We're thriving with it. So that's actually a lot of what we're going to be looking at in the following weeks of this introductory webinar. How can we get to that point where it's all good? <laughs> okay, so let's see. Sir Hanik, sorry, um, can we just repeat that last one one more time again? The last one of the second list now. Last one of the second list is often has trouble waiting their turn. Okay, great. Thank you. I'm, yeah. Okay, all right. Okay. So let's look at another case history to show us how we can begin thinking here. I'm just making this one up as a composite. I'm an eight-year-old child, a, a boy, who somewhat like our first kid here has meltdowns in class. But this kid here, he throws his desk around. He might punch people out, push them down, sometimes has hurt people. Uh, he refuses to do classwork when the teacher tells them that tells him that you know he has to do it he just says no um, the teacher definitely thinks this kid has ADHD and the child is definitely out of control but we have a little problem I just read you the criteria for ADHD and did anybody there notice anything about meltdowns Can you, did anybody see that in that in either of those two lists either inattentive or impulsive you know, in the impulsive one, I want to go back and look at that because um, we might think of the hyperactive impulsive. Um, okay, we have here, the, just the symptom picture is of a restless, agitated person. Maybe this kid has trouble falling asleep because he's all wound up. It doesn't even say that in the criteria. Um, but, you know, he's a very active kid. It doesn't say anything about meltdowns, temper tantrums, and yet when we see meltdowns and temper tantrums in a kid, especially in school, we often automatically default to like, oh, he's, he has ADHD. Why? <laughs> Let's look at where temper tantrums and meltdowns actually are part of the criteria for a mental health disorder. And we'll start with one that affects school kids, um, because this diagnostic one starts, you have to be eight years old to get this, eight to, eight to 16, it's a new diagno um, diagnosis. It's called DMDD, meaning Disruptive Mood Dysregulation Disorder. So this little guy here that I'm talking about who's throwing his desk around, <laughs> maybe that's what he has. Maybe he hasn't got ADHD. I, I has said anything here about him being fidgety or about him being inattentive. So why are we thinking ADHD? All we know about him is he doesn't want to do the schoolwork and he's throwing his desk around. So maybe he has disruptive mood disorder, DMDD. Let's look at the criteria for that one, okay? And put a little tick mark beside your uh, family member that you're thinking of, they have these criteria. I just want to say that um, sometimes ADHD, 
sometimes these other disorders are mistaken for ADHD. That's, that's why we're gonna look at them. But even more often, these other disorders are actually occurring with HD because most people with ADHD have more than ADHD. The vast majority of people have something else going on, okay, as we will see. So it's for DMDD. Severe temper outbursts at least three times a week, low or sad or irritable or a mood pretty well daily. The reaction to things going wrong is far bigger than one would expect for the age of the person. Symptoms begin before the person is 10 years old, so he doesn't just get this when he's 16, right? And in order to be diagnosed, he has, have, uh, he has to have the symptoms for about a year. And these symptoms have to occur in more than one place. So it could be at school and at home. It could be on the sports field and at school. Um, at home and with friends, you know, but it has to be in at least two places, all right? And there's a few other disqualifying criteria, but that's, that's it. Now, the thing that's interesting about this, let's say that we'll call this little boy, his name is Aaron, and let's say that he does actually have these temper tantrums at school three times a week or at home. His mother says, yeah, he has them, he has them at least three times a week at home as well. So he does meet that criteria. But let's say that this guy is happy. He's in a good mood most of the time. He is not, he's not in a bad mood. He's not sad or irritable. He's a happy kid, but he loses it, all right? Well, then he's got another disorder possibly because, you know, maybe he has something called ODD, which you might have heard about, which is, they have all these initials for everything, but oppositional disorder. Okay, what's the difference between that and uh, the DMDD we've just looked at? Well, here, tick off your, your symptoms too, okay? These are the symptoms of ODD. Easily temper or is easily annoyed. So we see that in the DMDD as well. Is angry and resentful. Well, we see that in the DMDD. Shows hostility towards authority figures. Um, with DMDD, it could be hostility towards peers as um, you know, siblings, classmates, friends. But uh, in ODD, it's an authority issue quite often. Refuses to comply with requests. Well, the person with DMDD might, but we don't know what the reasons are, but it's part of the ODD symptoms. Purposely annoys and upsets other people, has an intention there. Um, that is not found in the DMDD. It's not the D, the mood dysregulation disorder doesn't have the agenda to annoy anybody. Blames other people for mistakes. And we do see that in, um, in Reggie, but we do see that actually in ADHD and, and sometimes in DMDD, but it wasn't in the criteria list. So <laughs> it's in the criteria for ODD. See, children with oppositional defiant disorder, they have intent behind their behavior. They want to anger or scare other people. Um, and th that's different than the ADHD and the DMDD people who, when they do, because of their impulsive reactions, when they do upset or hurt people, they actually feel sorry about it. They feel remorseful. That's one of the big differences there. So. So this Aaron, does he have uh, oppositional defiant or disorder? We don't know, because you know, is he only acting out with teachers and with um, and with his parents? We need to know more, okay? Because actually, when we ask a few more questions, it turns out that this particular kid, the eight-year-old Aaron, he really only acts out like this, throwing his desk around and having temper tantrums at home when he has to do math. <laughs> it turns out that this is related to a subject in school. So what's going on? Does he have ADHD? Well, again, nothing here has pointed to that. Um, just doesn't like math. But when you don't like a school subject, there are different levels of reaction. And when you give a big overreaction, there's something else that might be going on. Um, the intense overreaction is a signal. It's not normal, okay? 
well, why is he having that? Does he, maybe he can't do the math. Maybe he has a learning disability and the frustration that he's feeling is over the top. And that's what we're seeing. Maybe that would have to be assessed. Okay, he needs a psychological assessment to find out. But let's say he has a psychological assessment and it turns out he doesn't have a learning disability. Well, maybe what happened was last year's math teacher humiliated him for not doing his math properly or whatever. And he's developed a sort of a math phobia now, or he has a bit of a post-traumatic stress reaction. Let's say on an ice, he now feels extremely anxious when confronted with math. And anxiety has that fight or flight chemistry that gets triggered. And let's say he just has a bit of a loose wire there. And that's what causes him to throw the desk over. Okay? He's feeling very anxious. And it's really anxiety that's beneath that. So he doesn't have ODD and he doesn't have DMDD, he has anxiety. But, you know, we won't know. We do see that kids who have huge meltdowns sometimes have OCD or they have anxiety. They can have explosions. When they're pushed, um, their anxiety rises and that fight or flight chemistry is released. Um, but, you know, we don't know because we haven't done the testing for it, but it could be actually that this Aaron does have ADHD because, well, let's look at the symptoms for anxiety. And again, I have to um, check this off on the person that you know about. Okay, here are some symptoms in children um, for anxiety. And a lot of them are in adults as well. Restlessness, fatigue, trouble concentrating. Okay, we actually see those three. Those are also an ADHD, right? Irritability, that's also an ADHD muscle tension, sleeping problems, okay, all of those are found in ADHD. But now they're also criteria for anxiety. Separate anxiety, that is not wanting to leave the house or be separated from the parents or worrying excessively, being fearful, having stomach aches and headaches, um, and phobias, which in children, the reaction to phobias is often tantruming. Could be freezing, just like refusing to refusing to do it, like refusing to do the schoolwork, or tantruming, exploding, and avoidance. Um, that's a again freezing type of thing, avoiding um, whatever we're fearful of. So you can see there's such an overlap between anxiety symptoms and ADHD symptoms that we cannot just stand back and guess, okay? We need questions to be asked by a diagnosing professional to separate this out. And it turns out that a lot of people with ADHD actually have anxiety also. So oh, some of the people who we think have ADHD, they just have anxiety, right? So, um, or some of the people who we think have anxiety actually have ADHD. We need the right questions. Well, so now I want to go back because I was thinking maybe maybe this Aaron fellow, maybe he has ADHD because, um, okay, it's a percent of the time people with ADHD have anxiety. That's a third of them, okay? But like we might ask, why was he having trouble with math, okay? Because I said, perhaps it's a learning disability, but perhaps he didn't like it so much. It's one of the subjects that bored him. And because he was bored, he's busy looking out the window and he's distracted. And so he's missing what the teacher's teaching. Now he's falling behind. Now he can't work. Now he's getting frustrated and he has low frustration tolerance and impulsivity. And so when asked to do the work, he's completely overwhelmed. He cannot organize himself. He doesn't know where they are because he missed half of it, half of it because he was daydreaming because he didn't like it. Okay. So in it was his original boredom, um, which was this ADHD thing he was just did, um, and not interested and therefore couldn't concentrate and therefore missed everything and now is uh, facing, um, what do you call it, like a struggle. Like he, 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 now he's facing his own ineptitude. He can't do it. Adoration is causing him to throw his desk over. So in fact, it could be ADHD. <laughs> we just have to ask the questions and find out. Um, okay, so it needs a proper assessment, basically. Now, there was one other symptom that if it turned out that 
the problem was not to do with the math. But we have a kid who in class just desk over during the week for no reason. Like he just gets, he gets ticked off easily. Either the teacher or something or a peer says something or there's some task he doesn't want to do or lunch wasn't good. I don't know, anything, okay? So it's not located in one subject, but he has a couple of explosive disorders, um, sorry, explosions twice a week, okay? And he has a three month period. He does these disorders actually hurt anybody and he doesn't destroy any property, it's, though it might be a close call, but nobody gets wounded, okay? So if he has two of these a week and nobody and nothing's getting destroyed, or if he has three of them in a 12 month period where in fact, yes, somebody does get hurt, okay? Like that, he punched somebody and sent a kid to the hospital when he was in school. He threw something and he destroyed it at home. And he had three of those episodes he actually might qualify for a diagnosis of IED, okay, intermittent excessive disorder. So uh, why don't you tell me, I want to see if you're listening, here's a little test for you, right? How would intermittent explosive disorder be different from DMDD, disruptive mood dysregulation disorder? Can you, can you see if you can figure that out? Because they both require a few meltdowns that are so what's the difference between DMDD, disruptive mood dysregulation disorder, and IED, intermittent explosive disorder? Um, some are saying that, that there's no remorse, um, destroying property, destructive. One is more constant. Um, the damage to property, damage and infrequent. DMDD is a regular occurrence. IED is irregular. These are um, great guesses. Um, but actually, the, the defining difference is in IED, there's no mood disorder. Okay. Uh, DMDD is listed under the depressive disorders in the DSM-5. DMDD is considered a mood disorder that has anger as one of its symptoms. Whereas IED, the person can be perfectly happy, except when he's throwing things around, <laughs> which isn't that often. So the level of destruction actually isn't the determining. The remorse, remorse is a differentiation between oppositional defiant disorder and conduct disorders. Lack of remorse there uh, is a symptom, but not these two, DMDD and IE, IED, they may or may not be remorseful. Doesn't it doesn't say it doesn't matter. The main thing is that the IED person be happy, a, a, a norm, you know, normally okay. <laughs> okay. Whereas the other one is grumpy every day, mad or mad, displeased. You know, we have some a lot of ADHD kids where they're very very happy apart from their ADHD, and then we have a bunch who are moody and negative all the time. Everything is wrong. Everything's unfair. Everything is bad. Likes me. I hate this house and all that stuff. Okay. So in fact, they have ADHD plus if they're throwing temper tantrums and have that grumpy attitude, then they might have DMDD as well. But if they're not throwing temper tantrums and they just have grumpy attitude, then they might have what 70% of ADHD people have. And that is a depressive disorder. Okay. So now let's look at criteria for depression. Depression, it says 70% of people with ADHD will actually seek treatment for depression at, at least once. That means that almost 100% of them <laughs> are depressed because not everybody seeks treatment for everything, okay? Adolescents with ADHD are 10 times more likely to suffer than adolescents without ADHD. Depression goes along with it all. You see, ADHD hardly ever sits by itself, even when we do criteria. So um, in bipolar disorder, for example, which is a type of depressive disorder, we'll look at it in a minute, but um, you could treat bipolar disorder with a mood stabilizer and that, that gets rid of the bipolar, but then the person is still disorganized, forgetting things, distracted and so on, because they may have bipolar and ADHD, or we may have depression and ADHD, 
or a, more commonly ADHD and depression. Okay, it comes out the same, but if you have ADHD, the chances of having your mood be seriously affected are very, very high. So here are some criteria for depression. Go down your checklist, okay? Uh, to be diagnosed with depression, you have to have, I think, five of these nine symptoms. Depressed mood, time, loss of interest in activities that used to be enjoyable, trouble paying attention and concentrating. So just note that that's also an ADHD symptom. Fatigue, that's also an ADHD symptom. There are, those two are also symptoms of anxiety, okay? Feeling worthlessness or low self-esteem or guilt. Weight loss or weight gain that's not explained by dietary changes. Sleep problems, too much or too little. And we can have sleep problems in ADHD and in anxiety as well. Psychomotor agitation, which means that, you know, that fidgeting thing, which we saw in ADHD. Thoughts of suicide. Irritability, impulsivity, and anger, which we do see in the ADHD group and in all the other groups we've talked about so far. Um, but in children and teens and men, depression is often expressed through irritability, impulsivity, and anger. You see the overlap. You see how difficult it is. This is why I was getting confused when I was doing this stuff. So now, just to make it more complicated, we have ADHD and post-traumatic stress disorder. These are two disorders that get really um, confused for each other. Because let's say your child, um, five years old, six years old, had been bullied by somebody at school and didn't talk about it, or was abused by a parent, a babysitter, some other person, sibling, you know, um, or is listening to the fighting going on in your house every night or um, has, you know, endured an accident, a robbery, a surgery, whatever. I mean, post-traumatic stress disorder symptoms are really common, but the behavior of a child who has post-traumatic stress actually looks an awful, an awful lot like ADHD. That's some of the symptoms here. Come off as we're going through. Okay, reliving the traumatic event over and over mentally and through playing, okay, acting it out. Um, now, you won't know if it's going on mentally unless the child's talking to you about it or unless the child's being asked, okay? Nightmares and sleep problems which we see in ADHD. Becoming really upset when triggered, but you don't know these are, and you don't know why that child's being really upset. It looks perhaps like the child has IED, the intermittent explosive disorder, or something else. But all of a sudden we've got like a crazy kid on our hands and we don't know why, but that could be from being triggered, which releases a lot of that fight or flight chemistry. Intense ongoing fear or sadness, depression, and mood disorder, irritability and angry as of meltdowns on a regular basis, very ADD-ish in terms of the impulsive side of that or the DMDD side of it, for sure. Um, easily startled, kind of hyper, that's ADD-ish. Spitting out. This is very interesting because a kid who's suffering from post-traumatic stress disorder can be looking out the window, but she's thinking what's going on inside her head, replaying things, um, listening to that fight from last night, worrying about the divorce, I don't know, the move, the, the death in the family, the illness, I don't know what's going on, right? Um, but her mind is occupied. But she looks to the classroom teacher and to her parents, just like the kid who is distracted by the airplane and the clouds. If you're distracted by the airplane and the clouds, that's the kind of disease you see in ADHD. But if you're distracted by your internal world, that might be post-traumatic stress disorder, PTSD. Right? Feeling numb, avoiding places and people um, that trigger the, the feelings so, and the memories, so that could look like just anxiety, the same as we saw avoidance and anxiety. So there's a lot of overlap 
And of course, a kid could have both of those things going on. It's not like people with ADHD are saved from being traumatized. They could be traumatized as well as having ADHD. But what you think is ADHD might actually be trauma. You need to ask the right questions, not you, but your diagnostician, okay? Uh, the bipolar thing I said would get to, there's an overlap in symptoms between ADHD and bipolar disorders. Now, bipolar, again, is a mood disorder, but the difference between bipolar and DMDD is that um, the word bi, okay, meaning two, up and down. So in a bipolar disorder, we have an expansive phase, a manic phase, where there's hypersexuality, um, there's a sense of grandiosity, uh, uh, a lack for sleep, and things that do not happen in ADHD, and they don't happen in DMDD. The reason DMDD came into existence is because there was a feeling that many children were being diagnosed as bipolar. And there was confusion between bipolar and ADHD also, but the implication is that a lot of children were put on heavy duty bipolar medications. So for DMDD, no medication is recommended. It's behavioral therapy, whereas bipolar is still managed very much with mood stabilizers. So the overlap between HD and bipolar is the inattention in both of those, um, problems with executive functioning, impulsivity, irritability, sensation seeking, um, restlessness, and substance use. Um, because a lot of people with both conditions, once they get a little bit older and are able to discover that substances can help them control their symptoms, they become substance users, okay? And then, you know, there's personality disorders. So uh, in personality disorders, like um, borderline personality, let's say, there's a few symptoms that overlap with the ADHD also, like explosive behavior, risk-taking, less need for sleep, um, impulsivity, you know, that can be very high, and uh, irritability and aggression. So we see these in the ADHD thing, and we sometimes see it in a personality disordered child. They didn't used to diagnose children so much with personality disorders, but they are beginning to do that now uh, to see that they, it's not just, you know, adults who can have those problems but children well. Uh, the last category I think that we'll look at right now is the autistic spectrum category and see how that lines up with ADHD because um, ASD or autistic spectrum disorder is the new kid on the block. If you take your child for an assessment today, it's very likely that he'll come out with an ASD assessment. Whereas let's say 30 years ago, if you took your child for an assessment, it's very likely that they'd come out with ADHD. Um, but there are some things that are similar here. Let's just see. We have um, social skills in both. Uh, we have, one second, the noticeable symptoms. Let me just see for a second. Um, a statistic person might also be on the go and on the move and fidgeting. That's one of the criteria. It's the same as an ADHD. Um, uh, the interrupting people, the impulsivity in both conditions, um, kind of the being in their own world, but for different reasons. Like that we said, the ADHD is not seeming to listen. The autistic spectrum disorder person is definitely not connecting and not listening and not having that social exchange that we expect. Um, agitated physically with various uh, in a ASD, it's going to be called self-soothing movements, um, but probably the ADHD um, hyper movement thing is also a form of something. And um, you know, both groups of these kids have trouble making friends, but for different reasons. So, anyways, we haven't addressed all the possibilities. All I wanted to do is kind of the issues here that looking at a child who's having difficulty learning in school, um, sitting and behaving appropriately in class, behaving appropriately at home, you and I and, and the teachers, none of us be able to figure out what's going on because the right questions must be asked in order to get deep enough 
to see, is this something going on with the way information's being processed? Has the child been experiencing difficult uh, emotionally, or is he bothered with anxiety, with trauma, with mood, um, with self-control? What is going on, right? It's very complicated. So I'm just gonna pause here for your thoughts and questions and whatever comes up right now. Um, but also, please write them down and Jillian will read them in a second. And also I think Jillian um, will tell people a little bit also about what we're gonna be doing in the next six weeks also, because all the symptoms I've mentioned, this is the way we talk about ADHD. I don't care what you call it, okay? Like ADHD, it's still treated symptom by symptom. So if you see that a child is having trouble, um, and once we, we have that diagnosis or whatever it is, uh, attending, then we have to, to help with improving concentration. We need whatever techniques will help. If the child is having difficulty with emotional regulation, then we're going to be dealing with, with helping the child acquire better skills at emotional regulation. If it's that the fight or flight um, chemistry is triggered, we're going to have to help the child, you know, to tone that down in his body and have a calmer nervous system in various ways. And for, you know, for every symptom we see, there is something that we can do either medically, psychologically, or with alternative treatments, or with all to try and, and, you know, dampen the things that would get in a person's way so that the child can be himself or the adult can be with all of the amazing right brain kind of gifts that come with ADHD, usually creativity and insight, intuition, drive, uh, passion. It's a very um, powerful, on the positive side, um, brain, the ADHD brain. So we wanna be able to clear the road so the child can use all the talents and gifts of ADHD and minimize the things that will make life hard in school, at home, and so on, um, whether that means addressing mood, addressing skills. And we're, we're gonna actually look at all that stuff really closely over the next six weeks. Um, if you wanna join us for the follow-up to this course, um, we'd love to see you there and we'll get into it more deeply, okay? So uh, Jillian, anything that people are saying that we need to hear? Yeah, about? I am. Um, we actually have one question that came up several times. Um, so I wanna make sure that we address that now and then I can see people asking how they can continue joining. So I will get to all of that information in just a minute, but I think the number one question I wanna get answered before we do go on is, why does it have to be called quote unquote a disorder or a syndrome it's you know in the olden days it was just they were kids we were all kids and you know some of these um, behaviors came up some were more permissible than others but why is it now that um it seems like we have so many different labels oh, for yeah. <laughs> these types of behaviors? I, I gave you so many to me they're, they're they're kind of ridiculous okay i'm with you Lola. I'll tell you, there's only one reason for them. Um, because we we human beings are just a complex bundle of strengths and kind of challenges and weaknesses within our system. I, I'm totally with that. And I don't like labels. There's only one benefit in an accurate label in a diagnostic sense. And that is if that label points to the right treatment. So for example, there's a lot of similarity between ADHD, DMDD, and uh, BP. What is it? Bipolar? Oh, bipolar disorder. I don't know, whatever it is. <laughs> BD, BB, whatever it is. BD, that's what it is. Okay, they, they, they shorten all these things. But anyways, each one of those points to a different intervention. The same thing, and even if we want to include anxiety there, the overlap of the symptoms, like they point to different medicines when we want to go to the medicinal route. And it makes a very big difference. I didn't even talk about Tourette and the tick disorders that are so common with ADHD. But if you don't call that a disorder, you may get the wrong medicine for your ADHD child because this the 
the normal stimulants that are given to control ADHD when we use medicine, which we don't always need to, we'll be discussing that in the course, but sometimes we want to. But if you, if you do want to use the medicine and you get a stimulant medication for a child who has an underlying tic disorder, it's going to unmask, as they call it, the tic disorder, and the child will now be twitching and tweaking and coughing and whatever it is. Um, you need to know if he has a Tourette's kind of mixture. Tourette's is when you have both vocal and motor tics. And tic disorders are extremely common in the ADHD population. So in fact, um, I just was one thing where I wrote that are common. Let's see if I wrote it down here. Yeah, it says roughly 80% of those with ADHD are diagnosed with at least one other of these disorders, okay? Uh, at some point in their life, the most common being learning disabilities, anxiety, CD, tics and Tourette syndrome, depression, sensory processing disorder, which we didn't get into today, and oppositional defiant disorder. Not limited to those, okay, <laughs> but those are common. So 80% of ADHD kids have something else. We need to know not to mess with their medications. Some of the medications for that to a child has ADHD and OCD will be very carefully titrated. So like, that's why, that's why we have the names. If we just know enough about medication, as far as the other interventions that are all behavioral, we don't really need these names. We see a kid, you know, like, I mean, behavioral interventions for depression, anxiety, and anger will cut across different categories. So it's only really when it comes to medication that those names might be useful for us to know, okay, to prevent uh, side effects, incorrect side effects, and, um, and optimal treatment, uh, to achieve optimal treatment, with the right diagnosis, okay? Okay, great. Thank you so much. Um, so I really just want to see who here is interested in continuing on for the next six weeks to get all of the self-help and management techniques that Sarah Khanna has now to work with. I think it was so important to come here today and really learn the differences um, and see, you know, if we already have a child with the diagnosis or if we're still trying to get that diagnosis. It's so important for parents to know the differences between what could be going on um, with their children and even within themselves, their spouses. So Sarhana, it was so wonderful to have that information coming forward. And I see a lot of people really interested in moving on. So let me um, get to that before we get to continued um, questions. And I can see um, questions are coming in. So I appreciate that. And please continue to send them as well. Uh, let me get you the information about the full course that we are offering today. So next week we will start our very first session on emotional regulation and that's going to talk about um, the best Man um, the best way to manage anger, meltdowns, and aggression, um, followed by medical, psychological, and alternative treatments for ADHD. And again, I think that Sarah Khanna just touched on that point. There are so many different um, treatments that are available, which is why it's important to know what we want to be treated in our children or in ourselves. Um, so there are medical ways to treat, there are our psychological, and then there, of course, are alternative treatments. But all of those together um, will continue to need, you know, parenting techniques and, um, of course, emotional support. So you don't necessarily want to just throw a medication at someone and hope that that takes care of it. We need all of these points together um, to really help manage all of the different um, challenges that either our children or ourselves are going through. Um, the next session will be self-help management, so creating a successful structure for you and your child to best handle ADHD at school, in the home, and at the workplace. Then we'll be touching upon um, children, teens, and adults with ADHD. Go from symptoms to solutions by finding the best interventions for all family members struggling with ADHD. In the next session, married and ADHD and married to ADHD, uncover how ADHD affects your marriage, how to deal with your own ADHD challenges, and the most effective ways to work alongside a spouse who is struggling with ADHD. Then parenting your child, 
um, with ADHD, get a toolbox of skills and strategies for striving and th thriving throughout this journey. And finally, a full hour of Q&A. So gain solutions to your personal questions through a live Q&A and implementation session. Each ongoing class will be live and interactive, allowing you to get your biggest questions answered and stay completely anonymous if you choose. They will all take place on Thursdays at 12 p.m. Eastern, 7 p.m. Israel time. And as I mentioned, our first class starts next week, Thursday, December 19th. Of course, if you cannot make it to one of the live classes, please don't worry. Um, sometimes that time might not be convenient for you, but you will always have a recording available to you in your own personal membership area. Every Sunday after the live class takes place, that recording will be available to you to listen to or download at your convenience. And those classes are there for you for a lifetime. So once you join, um, you'll have those classes. If you can't make it to a live class, you can also send your questions in ahead of time, or if you listen to the recording and have questions, please feel free to send those in afterwards. Um, and we will do our best to either have Sarahana address that on the next class, or of course, during our live Q&A session. Um, plus, in addition to all seven weeks of ongoing live classes, we're also throwing in some amazing bonuses the first one being achieving anxiety relief. So stop the worry, fear, and panic from taking over your life and use Sarahana's practical tools to help retrain your brain to react to stress with calm and acceptance so you can be the guide your child needs. Again, as Sarahana mentioned, there are so many different um, contributors to uh, ADHD, then anxiety could either be part of that or completely separate. But we wanna make sure that since anxiety isn't going to necessarily be addressed completely um, through this course, that you have an additional course that you can take at your convenience. It's all um, downloadable recordings that you'll have available to you when you purchase. Plus, in addition to that, we have a full course on healing through Bach flowers. This full series helps you discover the Bach flower remedies that have been used by adults and children for almost a century to help restore balance and heal emotional challenges. And again, that's a fantastic alternative treatment for so many of these symptoms. And we won't be able to go in depth into all of the different um, healing powers that the Bach flowers have in this course, but it is definitely a treatment that Sarahana recommends. So you'll have that as your bonus to listen to at your convenience. And finally, a series on breaking the cycle family anger. Anger is a normal emotion that both parents and children experience. However, when poorly managed, it can cause unnecessary pain and suffering for the whole family. <clears throat> Learn how to help yourself and your child manage, heal, and respectfully express frustration, upset, rage, and all other shades of anger. So as you can see, Sarah Hanna will be walking you through various aspects of parenting and emotional well-being to ensure that you and your family are set to thrive. You'll have one-on-one -on -one support throughout this program of seven weeks of live classes, and you'll also have the unique opportunity to get your personal questions answered that you haven't been able to get answered previously. Plus, these bonuses are ways for you to also delve into all of the other aspects that may not be addressed in the live classes, but now you'll have a way to get your questions answered for those too. But most importantly, by investing in yourself and your family, <clears throat> you'll discover how to curb your child's stress-inducing behaviors like hyperactivity and impulsivity while remaining calm, flexible, and in control. You'll be able to identify your child's gifts and challenges and focus on building the skills and managing specific areas of difficulty while cultivating ba balance and harmony at home and at school. <clears throat> Adopt the less stress approach to parenting and finally put an end to the exhausting, frustrating, and oh, oftentimes draining methods that just don't work. You'll learn how to reduce chaos and improve cooperation by teaching your child patience and solution-seeking skills that reinforce their independence and confidence. And finally, you'll be able to bring out the best in you and your child by overcoming personal limitations and developing increasing levels of competence, wisdom, and emotional power. An opportunity like this rarely comes along, but we listen to all of our members' requests, and together with a one-of-a-kind mentor, Sarah Hanna, we are offering the guidance you need and deserve for a highly reduced rate. 
regularly we would have this course available to you for $397 or the Platinum Package at an unbelievable rate of $497. But as I said this today earlier, uh, just for joining us right now, you'll actually save $100 on both packages. So you can either become a basic member and get the full seven part series for only $297, or you can become a platinum member and get the full seven part series plus the three bonuses, achieving anxiety relief, healing through Bach flowers, and breaking the cycle family anger for only $397 today. Plus, of course, we've made payment plan options available when you join so that you don't have to pay all at once to make it financially more um, comfortable for you. But I will say that we have 100 spots available, so I really recommend you joining as quickly as possible to make sure that you can get that spot and you can still save that $100 by joining right now. I'm going to go ahead and put the link right into your chat box. It's www dot jewishworkshops.com forward slash ADHD. I've put it right in your chat box so you can actually copy out the link and put it into a new browser so that you can stay on the webinar with us and continue listening, but still grab your spot right now and make sure that you get that introductory rate that we are offering just for today. <clears throat> Again, it's www.jewishworkshops.com forward slash ADHD. And as soon as you register, please come on back and let me know. Just put your initials or your first name and the words I'm in. I'd love to be able to welcome you and have an idea of how many of our spots are being taken up um, while we continue to answer questions. And of course, if you have any questions or need help registering, um, please come on back and put your name and your telephone number. I have Hannah here on the line with me. Adina will be on here later with us. Um, and we would all be happy to give you a call and help you get in and secure your spot. Um, I want to make sure, again, that if you um, are having trouble getting to the page or having trouble getting registered, you just come on back and put your name and telephone number. We often have a huge influx, you know, right away. People are all running to the page trying to get their spots, um, which can either cause a delay or it can cause some issues. Um, but I, we're here for you. So just let me know if you have any questions or need help. Um, and as I mentioned again, when you get to that page and you choose which package you'd like, whether you want to become a basic member or a platinum member, you can always um, choose a payment plan option that best fits your needs. That's right on the order form for you. Um, and again, please just come on back when you are registered and let me know that you're in. I'm going to put the link right there on your page as well. Um, it's jewishworkshops.com forward slash ADHD. And um, for all of those members of Sarah Khanna's family circle who are on the line with us today, um, it was so great to have you here. I do want to let you know because you're already a member of the family circle, you will have this available to you. So no need to register again. Um, that is one wonderful part of being part of Sarah Khanna's family circle is that you get all of these fantastic series as part of your membership. And by joining today, you'll also have the opportunity to get your first month free in Sarah Khanna's family circle. Just wait until after you register, you'll uh, be asked to redirect and you'll have that opportunity right there to sign up so make sure that you grab that chance as well not only will you have your seven part series on adhd but you'll also get the opportunity to continue on in sarahana's family circle which is her ongoing live community and you'll get um to begin a new series with her as well so sarahana we do have some questions coming in and i just want to make sure um that I can welcome people as you're joining. So welcome, uh, yep. Hadassah, it's great to have you. And welcome, Esther, wonderful to see. Um, please, like I said, come on back and let me know, just write your name and the words I'm in as soon as you have joined and grabbed your spot. Um, I do see a couple of people here with their phone numbers in because you're um, asking for some help. So no problem. We will get to you as soon as possible. Just make sure to stay by the phone because um, we will be giving you a call. Um, okay, so some of the questions I'd like to start with here. Um, sorry, let me just go back because there were some that came in ahead of time. Sarah Khanna, I guess the, the first question was if we already have um, a diagnosis for our children, 
um, what would be the first step in th that we can take today to begin um, helping that child? You know, if we already have the ADHD diagnosis. I mean, one, one of the big values in having the diagnosis is understanding that your child has a neurological neurological condition and is not reacting crazy um, because he or she wants to, okay? So that can allow you to begin to, um, it's still irritating to be with a getting all that negative feedback. So the very first step is is kind of manifesting your new compassion that the child is has got something like you have diabetes, you can't control your blood sugar, you know, you have to do something about it. So um, just taking a step back, okay. Um, and then I don't know whether the diagnostician recommended medication or not. And some people um, will get a that recommendation and we'll just start the child right away on medication to see if symptoms improve. And other people have more hesitation about starting a medication and, and want to try alternative things and will run to the computer or the health food store, whichever, you know, to find out what kind of alternative things can help the brain on a physical level. Um, but basically, we need to know with your diagnosis, is it primarily inattentive or is it primarily impulsive hyperactive? And you can begin to repattern your child's behavior by looking at what should the child be doing in this situation. Now, we didn't mention the things that I have produced and written, but I, in a few weeks, I believe, I have my little book coming out in hardcover called Better Behavior Now. I know some of you may have read that already, but that particular book I think is the first thing you should do because read that book. It'll be out in a few weeks. Um, where it will tell how to identify, okay, we, we can see the wrong thing happening right in front of us, but what is the right thing? What do we want that child to do? And how can we begin to move the child's wiring, brain wiring, so that he or she can now do the, what we call target behavior, the appropriate behavior, the new improved behavior, Parents have to be very skilled and we don't have that skill naturally. So I have spelled it out in um, a lot of detail for you in this new little uh, publication, which should be in um, the Jewish bookstores fairly soon and then available on Amazon as well. I don't know exactly when, but in the near future, uh, better behavior now. That's So that will cover the strategy that will cover any of your target behaviors for your child. Zero on what you want that child to be changing exactly, like which behavior exactly. Okay, that's where I'd start. Okay. Okay, great, thanks. Next question. Um, yeah, as a follow-up, how can an ADHD mother best help her ADHD, ADHD child? Yeah, you know, an ADHD tends to run in families. So usually we have one of the parents has at least some symptoms, if not the full picture, and the uncles and the cousins and the siblings of the family, there's, will have some mixture of things. Often one kid will have the ADHD, another one might have the anxiety, another one might be predominantly, um, you know, mood oriented, whatever. But, um, and so that genetic thing Listen, we all have genetic vulnerabilities. Um, the more we know how to help ourselves, the more we somebody else. So if you, for example, had low mood, but you had learned so many tools and strategies for lifting that mood and changing, um, what they call it epigenetic uh, healing, where you're actually changing your, your natural tendency so that it's no longer low mood. If you've done that for yourself, it's going to be so much easier to help your child do what your child needs to do. So um, 
if you haven't yet done it, getting on the journey as we go through the course and learning, well, this is what we would do for your child. Just make sure you're doing it for yourself too and working with the child. But we do have to understand and respect our limitations. So just for example, let's say we're um, irritable and short-tempered, whatever, ourselves. It is obviously going to be challenging to get the child to rein in his behavior if we haven't mastered our own. Sometimes just taking a couple of months and zeroing in on one or two things in yourself that you really want to fix and then working with your child. If your child has his problem for another two or three months while you're working on yourself in that area, be it, okay, like, you know, we have a lifetime ahead of us, like just start with you, as they say, put on your oxygen mask first and then tend to your your loved one there. So I would, I would say work on yourself actually and work on yourself with your child wherever it's possible. And you'll see when we go through the course, actually that there'll be a lot that you can do simultaneously, both for you and for your child. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Um, I want to go ahead and just welcome our newest members. Leah, welcome. Um, I'm so glad to see that you're in. Welcome, Hannah. Wonderful to have you. David, welcome. Great to see you here as well. Um, Malka, welcome. It's wonderful to see all of our new members. And please, again, once you're registered, come on back um, and let me know that you're in. If um, you want to just put your initials, that's good too. I'd love to be able to welcome you. And again, in case you're calling in, I'll put that number in your, the, um, the, the link in your um, chat box again. It's www.jewishworkshops.com forward slash ADHD. Um, so you can go ahead and just copy that out and put it into a different browser so you can still hear uh, the rest of the webinar and the questions that we're talking about here. Um, but you can also grab your spot. And welcome, Sharon. Wonderful to have you as well. Um, it looks like a couple of the questions that are coming in right now are asking primarily about um, adults with ADHD. I'm the dad who has ADHD. Um, I'm sure this will be helpful for me and will it, yeah. and hopefully helpful for my family. Um, yes, I do want to just go back here for a minute. I may have gone a little bit quickly. I oftentimes get very excited to give all of this information over, um, but just to show you again the classes that we'll be going through. So we have um, a session on emotional regulation. The session two with the treatment advice, that of course will pertain to both children and adults. Um, and then you can see in session three, um, we're again talking about self-help management skills. So not only will that talk about helping your children at school and in home, but also helping yourself as an adult in your home and at the workplace as well. Um, session four covers children, teens, and adults with ADHD. Session five is specifically speaking about you and your spouse who may be struggling with ADHD. Um, and then session six is back to focusing really on your children. And seven, of course, is talking about a full um, hour of Q&A, so getting all of your personal questions answered. So if you are the adult with um, uh, ADHD challenges and you uh, hope um, to be able to help yourself throughout this process as well, th this course will absolutely um, discuss that and focus in on both parent, child, adult um, recommendations of how you can uh, deal with those challenges. Um, and again, with just the bonus classes, um, really also being able to hone in on some of the other challenges that come alongside. As Sarah Hanna mentioned, ADHD doesn't always um, or rarely really uh, sits by itself. So um, if you also find yourself struggling with anxiety, we have the full um, six part series on achieving anxiety relief, plus the alternative treatment um, full eight part series on healing through Bach flowers. And that will certainly help you find um, some different kinds of treatments, not only for ADHD, but also for challenges that you may be facing alongside that. And then of course, the third one is dealing with anger. Um, so just to remind everyone, the classes that are the seven part series 
All live classes are taking place on Thursdays right at this time. It's 12 p.m. Eastern, 7 p.m. Israel time. Um, but again, if you can't make it to a live class, please don't worry. Um, it is still absolutely worth your time, energy, and effort to get these solutions from Sarahana and have the guidance that you need. Um, you will have recordings available to you um, and each week, and you'll be able to listen to those and download them at your convenience. Of course, uh, then again, you can also um, email in your questions if you have questions um, before or after those classes take place so that you can still make sure you get those questions answered. Um, so let me go ahead and get to some of these other questions that came in. Sarahana, we had um, some questions dealing with um, parents who are really getting frustrated um, I feel frustrated when I have to repeat myself so many times and my son still doesn't quote unquote hear me um, or want to follow what I'm asking him. How do I stay uh, calm in a situation um, where I just am not being heard? So we will look at that challenge in depth, okay? In the next six weeks, it's gonna come up again and again in different ways. Because um, one of the danger points for the ch child who has ADHD is being on the receiving end of a lot of understandable parental frustration. So we're gonna do our very best to save you from that feeling, okay? Um, but I'll, I'll give you just like one tip. There's going to be a lot of them, but one tip is, you know, walk right up to the child, get his attention first, turn his head to you, you know, and make sure he's there, and then quietly tell him no more than two times, okay? two is your maximum because most of us get pretty upset when we're on our third time okay so you're going to tell him i need you to get ready for bed now or whatever it is i need you to do your homework now or you need to uh, take your plate off the table now or whatever whatever you want him to do um, you have to be beside that child don't call from another room don't call even from the room that you're in make sure that you've got his attention before you speak. You might even ask him to repeat it back to you if you, if you feel that's necessary or helpful. Um, and then you're gonna lay on that praise when he starts to do the thing you just asked him to do. Like, if, even if you had to hand him the plate and say, I need you to put this in the sink right now, and then he does it. And then you're gonna like just lay on the praise and the recognition and whatever. But we're gonna go into that um, because we don't want you being upset <laughs> although it is it is so challenging but i think that it's easier to parent a child when we know he has a diagnosis actually because we now know it's not our bad parenting it's not our fault it's not his fault um you know it is a situation that's real and that needs to be dealt with professionally on the parent's part like we it's not an emotional battle between us and this child we just upgrade our skills okay Thank you so much. Yeah. Um, the next question we had was, we're dealing with constant sibling fighting due to our son's impulsivity, taking their toys, hitting them for no reason. He argues with almost every instruction or has tantrums when he doesn't like my instruction. And then my, my consequence, like a timeout, always brings on a tantrum. Now we're dealing with our other children who are looking at him like he has a problem and I don't know how to handle that situation. So again, that little book, Better Behavior Now, read it carefully and seriously and apply it. It's actually going to help you quite a lot. Um, the course though, is really where we're going to find practical how to's. I, I hate to say that because, but I, but I wanna give you a full answer and in in, that's where you're gonna find the full answer. Um, but let's make a short answer just to you know, get us started. The child is bothering siblings. And this is what the ADHD child does is he, he doesn't seem to know how to join in um, appropriately. So he just kind of flicks somebody or he says something provocative, I'm all going, and he gets that attention that he wants, the stimulation that he wants, but everybody's so mad and upset uh, with him. And he gets used to, to um, that cycle, actually. And we've got to put him on, we're going to teach him how to get on a different path. Again, we're always asking, what is he, what should he be doing instead of 
you know, bugging somebody, let's say just sitting at the table and just elbowing them or doing all those things. So part of it is going to be behavioral. But to be fair, part of it is going to be physical. We need a lot of physical interventions to help the brain readjust what it's doing as well. So it doesn't necessarily have to be medication. And keep in mind that the medication for ADHD doesn't treat the annoying characteristics you just described, okay? It treats um, an inability to concentrate and a um, impulsivity, kind of that fidgety, it, it quiets down the system. But if someone has a strong will and needs things to be his way, it gets upset when they aren't, there, there isn't a medication that's just for that. Although in the Bach flower thing, which is that book and that whole course that I recently did for Jewish workshops, eight, eight weeks of it, does have the right remedies to help you with the very strong-willed child. And you will learn about that there too. Um, it depends why the child, you know, you've re you mentioned a couple of different circumstances under which this child gets himself into a funk. And each one of those might have to be dealt with differently. But um, physical interventions will be part of the solution. Just kind of by the way, they found that for um, intermittent explosive disorder, that kind of uh, just, you know, upset, crazy thing, that responds very well to anti-stimulant, uh, sorry, antidepressive uh, SSRI kind of medications and sometimes mood stabilizers. Just for little, if it's us as an adult and we're wreaking havoc on our marriage and we, you know, we don't want to be, sometimes that kind of medication just takes that problem away. But before we try medication, there are behavioral approaches that we can try. So it's good to have a lot of different options and we will be looking at those. That's all I can say for now. Great, thank you so much. Um, I wanna go ahead and welcome our newest members. Welcome, but Sheva, welcome um, Sharon. Welcome, Dove. Wonderful to have all of you. Oh, and welcome, Sarah. Excellent. Um, please continue to come on back and just let me know that you're in with the words I'm in um, or I signed up. I'd love to be able to welcome you. Um, we are going to be closing up in just a little bit. So before we do, if you have any questions or need help registering, please come on back and put your phone number in. Um, once we close up the webinar, unfortunately, I won't be able to get any of that information from you. Um, so come on back and let me know that you need some help. We are here to do that. Um, Sarahana, again, before we're getting ready to close, I just want to see if we can get to a few more questions here. Um, I had a question that just came in. My children have been diagnosed with ADHD and are currently on medication, but the minute that the medication starts wearing off, you can literally tell the difference between, you know, this calm person to the hyperactive, can't go to sleep, doesn't want to go to, you know, take their bath. Um, so how can we, I guess, best um, transition from, you know, when medication is wearing off to um, still keeping them somewhat regulated? Right. Well, this is the thing there for ADHD, even for depression and even for anxiety, nobody is saying that the pills that we have, the medications that we have can do the whole story. They can do part of the story. They can help but they can't do the whole story. So we do need as parents to have um, other strategies to teach our children, to help our children with. And you're asking about what kind of strategies. It's now nighttime, we're off the medication. Um, there may be a transition to Bach flowers in the evening, actually, that can help you take out, like Bach flowers don't interact with any medication you're on. So they're like water to the system and yet they, they can sometimes help as effectively as medication for especially for behavioral issues. So they can at least tone things down and make it easier for you to put in new behavioral programs. Once you put in a new behavioral pattern for your child, it can get wired into the child's brain and becomes part of his neurology. Because what happens at first is that the child, because of his nature, um, let's say, when you call him, he runs in the other direction. So he does that once, he's more likely to do it twice. If he's done it twice, he's more likely to do it the next time. And the reason for that is because his brain is learning how to do a behavior just the same way as when you're practicing, I always say your tennis stroke, your brain is 
this is a very bad tennis stroke, I guess, but anyways, uh, anything you practice gets wired into the brain. So our ADHD kid is constantly practicing the wrong behaviors, okay? So we're going to get that child to practice different behaviors, which then become part of the child's neurology. It gets wired in and he's able to do the new behaviors because they're now part of his brain. And so we'll be looking at that in detail, how to get that, okay? Great, thank you. Um, I think just as the follow-up here, um, there's someone else who was asking about medication in general. I feel like my kids are almost zombie-like when they're on their medication, and I'd love to see them back as their vibrant selves, but I know that that, I can see that that medication does help them concentrate more. Um, is there something else that I can do as a parent? There are other things. I don't know if you explored a whole lot of other things before you went on medication, but the nice thing about ADA, ADHD medication is that it's very short lasting. So if you, you know, it works only for the few hours that you're taking it, it doesn't stay in the system for a very long time. If you go off of it, you go off of it, you can go back on it and it will work again. So if you wanted to try some of the other things and see how far you can get, because this complaint about being zombie-like does happen to some people sometimes, not all the time, but if it happens to your child and it bothers you and you know you want your child's personality to shine through you may try some of the other things that we learn in class and see does that give you good enough results we're always weighing uh, the kind of the cost harm benefit you know if the child is now able to make friends is able to succeed in school um, you know, whereas before he was totally floundering and feeling like a failure and f experiencing so much rejection and struggle, um, it might be worth it to be a bit zombie-ish. You know, you have to make that calculation. Um, but if he was not doing so terrible and you haven't completely explored the other options, then go off for a bit and explore the other options. Some of the other options you can actually stay on the medication and explore and you'll see their effect uh, during the periods when you're not offering medication. So like in the evening or on the weekends or on holidays or whenever you don't offer medication. So yeah, let's, let's just look at it together. Excellent. Thank you so much. Um, it looks like we have time for one or two more questions. So I'm going to go ahead and get to um, this one that just came in. But if you do have any other questions, um, either pertaining to the course or um, questions that you'd like answered with Sarahana now on the line, please come on back and just let us know in the chat box here. I also want to remind you um, today, thank God, we had hundreds and hundreds of people on the line with us. It was wonderful to see each week. Um, um, during the classes, there will be less, significantly less people on the line. Um, you will have more of a chance to get your questions answered. And of course, um, as part of being in the course, not only will Sarahana be able to address questions each week throughout the series, but then we also have that full hour of just Q&A time. So um, if we missed your question today um, or didn't have a chance to get to it, please know that this follow-up course is meant to be here specifically to answer your questions, um, get as much content out to you as possible so that you can start taking all of these new skills that she'll be teaching, um, new strategies, new techniques, and helping you implement those into your personal situations throughout um, your journey with ADHD in your family. Um, so let me see here. Okay, my son's out of line behavior encourages my other kids to blur boundaries, also rocks the stability of our home. When I'm able to keep calm and try to deal with the craziness patiently and calmly, um, I I'm happy for myself, but it's extremely difficult and all the kids are suffering. There's just so much more I can't even describe, but it's more than regular children misbehavior. Sometimes he could be extremely creative and it's, um, just when he and and can be silly, but sometimes he has um, really, um, sorry, I'm looking at this, really excessive and out of hand behavior. Um, how can I help with that situation without screaming, which is what I want to do? <laughs> um, you know, 
I'm just kind of listening to your description that sometimes he's very silly and sometimes he's highly destructive. Um, that is actually, if you look, you know, at childhood bipolar disorder, I didn't diagnose your child, but I'm saying if you look at that, that's, that's exactly what it says. There are periods of extreme silliness alternating with um, extreme rage or destructiveness that's kind of beyond the norm. Um, so one thing is, like I said, it's about asking questions because what if it turned out that a nice mood stabilizer, child-friendly one for his size of body and everything, put an end to all that? I mean, at least let's ask the question your, to your diagnostician, is there, could it be that something else besides the ADHD is going on? As we saw in almost every case, there is something else besides ADHD that's going on. So that's one thing to think about. And then there are plenty of interventions that we'll learn on the course that will make life a little easier. But the truth is that when the child is at the mercy of his physical programming, his brain programming, his neurological stuff in there, um, so is the family. We're all at the mercy of that child. And it is so hard. And to ask ourselves to smile all the way through mom, well, listen, we'll do the best we can, but we're human and our nerves will be worn thin and the children who are siblings of that, yes, they will suffer from it. So we want to do the very, very best we can, which is we have to learn everything out there. And it's not in the mental health field. There's no perfect science. Everything will contribute a little bit to make it a little bit better. Um, and not being enraged at the child and not having father-son conflict, which is so common in, in uh, the ADHD homes and you know, not having the bad stuff is so preventative to bad outcomes with ADHD, which we didn't look at any of the, like what happens in the long run with these children, you know? Uh, but we will be looking at that. I, I, there's just too much to say. Well, you just have to join us and we'll, we'll look at it together. Great, thank you. Um, let me go ahead and just um, welcome our newest members. Sippy, welcome. Welcome, Miriam. Wonderful to have you as well. Um, it looks like Rifka's part of the community now, so welcome and um, welcome Gwen. Great to have all of you here. Um, please continue to come on back and let me know. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and wrap up in just another minute or so. So please put your name and telephone number right in the chat box if you still need some help registering. Um, we definitely want to go ahead and get as many people registered as possible while our introductory rate is still being offered so that you have that opportunity to get such a fantastic deal um, with all of these wonderful um, um, classes in your seven-week course plus these bonus courses, um, some of which have never been offered before. So please come on back and um, grab your spot now. So Hannah, um, I'm going to just ask you if you could leave us with some parting words. There are still, thank God, hundreds of people here with us. And if somebody's still on the fence, if they're not sure if this course is for them, um, if you could go ahead and just address that and um, leave us with your words of wisdom. <laughs> the, the truth is that the material that we're going to cover in this course would make us um, better, happier, more successful parents, period, of any kind of child, okay? But all of our children will have issues, okay? If they don't have full criteria for any of the fancy things we talked about today, that doesn't matter. All children have anxiety. All children have their moods. All children have their anger. All adults have the same. What we're going to learn in the course will actually pertain to every one of us and will just help you be a more professional parent all around anyways. If you happen to have a child who has a load of symptoms, then you're going to be more competent and um, calmer because you'll know more what your options are, what you can do and what you can't do. Um, you're going to not feel so out of control and you're and just kind of lost, you know, so that will help you if you do have a child who is difficult in any way, not just the ADHD way, um, because of the nature of the material we'll be learning. Yes, we'll be talking about ADHD, but it will apply to all the syndromes we've talked about today and every other one. <laughs> you know, we, there's things we didn't mention today, like I said, the substance abuse, the eating disorders, the things that our adolescents run into when they're normal, okay, because this is life. We're all neurologically challenged. We're all human. So I think this course is going to be for everybody and that you would all enjoy it, whether or not a special needs person in your family. That, 
that's what I think. Okay. Great. Thank you so much. Um, I'm sorry, I did just see a question come in and I had missed it from earlier and I want to make sure that um, she gets her question answered. Um, if my child is close to 16 and has been diagnosed with ADHD and LD since he was six, is this course going to help me and address um, those specific needs? Well, we will be looking, like I said, at, at specifically at the differences in teenagers and in adults and in relationships such as marriage. So I think, you know, knowing what's coming down the pipe for your child um, would be helpful. And I don't know how much you've done and how like some some parents are already complete experts. You know, you, you know the whole field. You've been involved. Other parents have um done a slice of the involvement, they have the assessment, they're giving the medication, um, you know, they're doing little things, but they haven't got the whole picture. Maybe they don't know what the alternatives are. So I don't know where you are on that spectrum, but, you know, ADHD in adulthood is its, its own thing. And we will be looking at that because, in fact, so many people are adults with ADHD who were never diagnosed and who are never going to be diagnosed. But when we can help them, and ourselves being some of those people, um, life is going to be better for the entire family. So I would stick around for it. For, like, you know, that's what I would say. Great. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sarah Khan. I really hope that you feel better. You sounded yes. wonderful today. Oh, and terrific. thank you so much for getting us all of this information. It is so important. Um, and thank you to everyone who joined us from all over the world. It was wonderful to see you all here today. Um, please, I'm going to actually uh, leave the webinar open for a little bit. Um, you won't hear anything. You won't see us anymore. Um, but at the very least, if you still have um, questions or need help registering, it'll allow you to go ahead and put your name and telephone number in um, just to make sure that we can get uh, in contact with you and help you secure your spot. Um, and it looks like so nice. Everybody's writing, thank you. Great to see you, Sarah Khanna. Mm -hmm. um, thank you so much. You've really given me a lot of help today. Um, here we have someone asking about the payment plan options. Um, please just put your name and telephone number right in here and we will give you a call to help you with your payment plan options. Absolutely. Um, thank you again, Sarhana, and thank you to everyone here. Have a My wonderful pleasure. day. Thank you. And all of you too. Thank you.